You ever ask why? All the time. Why am I here? What purpose do I have on earth? Why? Sometimes whys are big issue whys, like why am I on earth? Well, what is my purpose? Or it could be smaller whys, like oh, why do I? Uh, why am I hungry right now? Why? Oh yeah, I haven't eaten in an hour. So you know, we have we have whys. There's why we ask the question why, but sometimes our whys are left unasked. Sometimes we just kind of go through the motion. And here's what I, what I realize is without the why, the what of what we do often becomes dull, boring, routine, meaningless. Even if it's a good why, lose sight of the why and we lose sight of the purpose and we lose motivation. Keep the why in mind. It will help even through the mundane minis- uh, minutia of life. The why of why I'm changing that diaper can help me get through the mundane task of changing that diaper uh, or cleaning up that blowout, as we called them in in our family. So today I want to talk about putting or keeping or adjusting, altering the why in your what. We do what's every day. Everything we do is a what. It's a what. But why do we do what we do? Uh, maybe we need to change some what's to conform to some more important whys. Maybe we need to change some whys uh, of why we do what we do. Maybe we need to change some motivation, tweaked or removed altogether. What's can always be changed. What's are not locked in stone. What's are just means to accomplish the whys. What's are the methods The whys are the motivation. The whys are the reason why we do what we do. Uh, For example, why buy a car? Well, we can say because I need transportation. I need to get from point A to point B and B to C and C to D. and I, I need transportation. And then the what of the why could be anything from walking. Uh, That is one form of transportation, so I maybe not need a car. Uh, Jonathan spent three months in Tokyo, and he said the very few people in town in the city have cars. They ride bikes, and they have big, massive bike parking lots at the metro stations. And people get on the trains and go go to where they need to go. So there's transportation. In an earlier era of our country, it would have been horse and buggies or, you know, walking or... Um, people ride bikes, people do all kinds of things. So the need for transportation is is more like a why, and the what is how we choose to go about it. Make sense? You follow that. So that's true about every why and every what. We have a why, we do what we do, and then there's the what's. And what's can become uh, kind of meaningless unless we keep the why's in mind. Sometimes uh, economic reasons, like for example, buying a car, might come into play when it comes to uh, transportation. I might uh, prefer to drive a Mercedes-Benz, you know, uh, but maybe I can only afford uh, a Chevy or a, a Ford truck. Or I might prefer that Chevy truck over the... Uh, Toby's shaking his head. Yeah, that's what I'd prefer over the, uh, over the other. Uh, and sometimes there's multiple whys that kind of come into play. The why is, okay, transportation. The what would be, okay, you know, one or the other or other options. But maybe I want to look really cool while driving back and forth to work, uh, driving around town. And that could be I either want to be in that Mercedes or I want to look cool in that old truck, you know, so there's, there's multiple, there, there's whys, there's whys behind what we do about everything in life. And it behooves us, it's to our advantage to check in on our whys. Why do we do what we do? Why are we here? Why does the church exist? Why do I attend? Why do I participate? Why do I get married? Why do I pick a job? Why do I go to college? Why? 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 We could drive ourselves crazy thinking about all the whys. And I certainly don't want you uh, to do that. You know, some whys eventually become meaningless. Uh, I I talked with a young lady once who went through four years of college in an elementary ed program, got out of college and worked in that field for a couple years and then just quit 
And years later, she told me the why. She said, my family wanted me to go to school. My family wanted me to go into elementary education. My family, uh, and of course, then, you know, there, she, she let that happen. And she went through four years of college and worked for a couple years and just gave it up. Because her why was not her why. Her why was somebody else's why. Somebody else thought that she should do that. And so our whys can become meaningless. That why to please my family eventually ran out of gas. Eventually stopped being a meaningful enough motivation um, to get her through. Now we can have a great why in life, but our what's may not be helping us to reach our whys. Our whys, like I, I might have a why of wanting to live a healthy lifestyle, but my what's may not be helping me do that, right? My eating habits, my exercise or lack thereof habits. We might have some good whys, uh, but our what's are not helping us to accomplish that. Where we're letting other things become more important. And, and this is, this is going to help us when we really begin to think about this, whether you're a follower of Christ or not, uh, this is true just in life. And this is more than a, a motivational speech for sure. Um, but we want to really think about our whys and, and begin to align more and more, maybe not begin to, but continually adjust our what's to our whys. Now, you might have some horrible whys in life. Like, I, I, for example, I'm sure Bonnie and Clyde had some uh, horrible whys to what they did. Peter had a why to why he denied that he knew Jesus, right? He, he was afraid that he was next, that they would uh, you know, capture him and, and ultimately crucify him or imprison him or put him to death. And so he had a why behind his denial. We're not going to talk about that story today. It's just an example about that. But here's something every parent knows when a parent says to their child, why did you do that? It was like with that flabbergasted kind of... Uh, um, tone in the, why did you do that? And the child says, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Or starts with a B, because, because. Every parent knows that those are not real answers. Every parent knows that. But when we give those kind of answers, we, we think they're legit. As adults, we think they're legit when we're adults. Why did I do? I don't, I, I, I don't know. Maybe it's just like the child. We don't really want to say why we did what we did. So, uh, one thing I've learned about Jesus is he likes to mess with our whys and our whats. And the reality is, we want him to mess with our whys and our whats. We may not like it when he does it, but ultimately, we want him to. Because this is true. Those who follow Jesus get better at life, and life gets better for them. And in order for that to happen, Jesus has to mess with our whys and our whats. He has to. He, he, he loves us just like we are, but somebody said he loves us too much to leave us that way. And so we want him to mess with our whys and our whats, because life gets better uh, for those who follow Jesus, and we get better at life. I found that to be true. Now, Andy Stanley, in a book that he wrote called Visioneering, uh, gives this analogy. If your job in life was to fill sandbags, and you went to work every day, and you just filled sandbags, how dull, how boring that would become over time, right? It would take me about half a day for that to become boring for me personally. Uh, but... If your job was to fill sandbags because your town was about to flood and it was going to save your property and the property of your friends and neighborhoods all, uh, and your friends and neighbors, all of a sudden that filling of sandbags becomes really significant and really important even though it's a dull and mundane type of job. And I believe this. God wants to put a why into everything that we do that is bigger than the whys that we currently have. He wants to put a why into your life that is bigger and better than anything that you may currently have. And are you willing to let him mess with your why? Are you willing to let him mess with 
your what's. Uh, I want us to take us a look at something Jesus said that gives us a why and a what in terms of something vitally important for every one of this. Now, as we look at this, let me encourage you to not think of this as reading from the Bible. What we're actually reading is a a recorded conversation between Jesus and an individual by the name of Nicodemus. And because he came to Jesus at night, a lot of people have called a sermon like this, Nick at Night. So Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. We're not going to read the whole con- that, that whole conversation. You can read it uh, in John chapter 3. And there's one verse, one verse in John chapter 3 that probably you've heard, even if you're not real familiar with the Bible, uh, e- even if you've never read the Bible, you've probably heard this verse or heard some version of it or heard something like it, or uh, you, you've, you've seen some things related to it. And the verse is this, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever would believe in Him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, have you ever seen something like this at a football game or a baseball game? Or go ahead and pull up that neck. See that that, that yellow uh, in there? John 3.16. John 3.16. That's the verse we just uh, read. Um, You might have recited that with me, or you you might have that verse memorized. Uh, But they put it up there because they hope somebody is going to look up John 3.16 and and take a look at it. But that that verse is God's big why and God's big what. It's His why and His what. Now see if you can figure out this out for me. So God's why is what? One word. Love. (coughs) Love. Now... We hear about love, we talk about love, we read about love, we sing about love. You know, all you need is love, the Beatles, and there's all kinds of things about love. This can be kind of, if you're not careful, we can just hear it and let it bounce off and not real think, not think real deep about it. But here, um, John is telling us in this conversation that he had, uh, that he recorded between Jesus and Nicodemus, uh, Jesus is telling Nicodemus, I want you to know something, buddy. God loves the world. Now, Nicodemus would have said, yeah, I know God loves Israel. We're His chosen people. God loves Israel. God loves Gentiles? You think of modern-day Israel. God loves the Iranians? God loves the Iraq people? God loves... God loves Americans? Oh no! You know, God loves the Russians, God loves the Chinese, God loves the Japanese, and God loves every person in every one of those nations and more. For God so, don't you, loved the world. That word so, what does it mean? He loved the world so much. He loves you and me individually so much. Much. That's his why. Love is the reason that Jesus told Nicodemus that he needed to be born again. Nicodemus, if a man's not born again, he doesn't even see the kingdom of heaven. And I'm telling you that, Nicodemus, because I love you and because I want you to be in the kingdom of heaven. God so loved the world. He doesn't want people to perish. Nicodemus, I love you and I want you to know something. Your religion does not keep you from perishing. Your morality does not keep you from perishing. Those things are ineffective and they don't work as good as they might be on an earthly resume. They don't get you to what you really ultimately want in life. And I love you and I need you to know that, Nicodemus. And because I love you, I am telling you that. So that's the reason that Jesus told Nicodemus that he needed to be born again. And and, you know, we often stop with John 3.16. The next verse says this, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. So Jesus is laying that out there. Verse 16, He says, It's either perish or everlasting life. And Nicodemus, because I love you, I want you to know this. And here he's saying in these verses, 17 and 18, that there's either condemnation or not. 
And because I love you, I want you to understand this. Now, one of the objections I've heard to people, some people having about Christianity is this. Oh, how, why would God's going to condemn me because I refuse to believe in Jesus? No, that's not the way it works. The reality is, I'm already condemned. God's not going to sink my ship if I refuse to believe in Jesus. My ship is already on the way down. And God is throwing out the lifeline. And so no, God doesn't condemn people for refusing to believe in Jesus. They just refuse to accept the lifeline, the one and only lifeline that is thrown out. That God, out of His love, love is the reason that Jesus later said this. Now, this wasn't in a conversation with Nicodemus, but it was in the same third chapter of John. And then Jesus was saying this, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Now, we like that. But whoever rejects or does not believe in the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. So the reality is that we don't like to think about is is the the wrath of God is real and it is, is, I'll tell you what it's like. When I was in college in in Williamsburg, Kentucky, there was a section of our dormitory that we called the dungeon. It was was kind of built on on the side of a hill and part of that is like some of our houses perhaps that's built on the side of a hill. Part of that was underground. The rest of it was all above ground, but on the back side of that, uh, that part of the, it was I section, it was the, the dungeon was partially underground. Anyway, that doesn't really matter. But one day, uh, the water pipes uh, up above started dripping in one particular place, and there was a drop ceiling. And, and that drop ceiling was such that it held the water as long as it could. And then you know what happened. One particular room, when, the, when that gave way, that whole room just got deluged. Uh, with water and, and ruined most of the things that were in that room. And, and, and the reality is the wrath of God, the judgment of God is being stored up. It's being held back, but it's being accumulated. And there will come a day, read Revelation, when the wrath of God is poured out on this earth. And Jesus delivers us from the wrath to come. Jesus, del- the wrath is coming. I'm either under the wrath of God now or not. And Jesus is the one who delivers us. Years ago, Zanesville, my family went and saw the uh, uh, Noah movie with Russell Crowe. And afterwards, you know, I went into the bathroom to relieve myself. So I'm standing there and I broke a cardinal rule. I talked to the person next to me while standing there. I said, did you see Noah? And he said, yeah. I said, um, Next time God destroys the world, it's not going to be in a flood. But Jesus is the ark that saves us. He just, and out of there. Like, yeah, yeah, my son told me I broke the cardinal rule of, uh... now here's what I hope. Here's what I hope. Someday that guy is going to stand up in a church somewhere and give his testimony and say, you know what? I was standing at a urinal one day and this guy, this crazy idiot, said that to me. But you know what? It got me to thinking. Either that or he's telling the story, there's a crazy idiot out there and, you know, whatever, whatever, you know, so Jesus said, in effect, he's the ark. He's the one that saves us from the deluge. He's the one that saves us from perishing. He's the one that saves us from condemnation. He's the one that saves us from, from, from the wrath that is coming. And, and, and he says that because he loves us. He cares about us, for God so loved the world. Now, love is the reason that Jesus had to correct Peter on one occasion. Maybe you're familiar with this. This is Matthew 16, verses, starting at verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed on the third day, be raised alive. Now, Jesus explained that to them many times. He told them over and over and over. They just didn't get it. They didn't get it because they didn't want to get it. They wanted Jesus to align with their plans instead of aligning their plans with Jesus. That's going to become clear in just a moment. So, uh, you know, I'm going to be... I'm going to be killed. I'm, I, and I'm, but third day, I'm going to be raised to life. Now, Peter took him aside. Jesus, can you? Jesus, come here. Jesus. All this talk about dying, not going to happen. I'm not going to let it happen. 
You know, see this sword? I- I'm ready to take it out and use it to defend you. It's not gonna. And besides that, Messiah doesn't die. Like you're, we've come to believe that you are the Messiah and you're going to usher in a kingdom and you're going to raise Israel to new heights and glory like King David a long time ago. And that, that, that's what's going to happen. And so would you, would you just stop talking? <laughs> can, you, can you imagine that conversation? We just get the Reader's Digest condensed version of it uh, in, in Matthew so, so Peter takes Jesus aside and begins to... The word rebuke means correct. He began to correct him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter. You get this kind of quickly and, and perhaps at least sternly, maybe sharply, uh, but in love. Okay? Um, Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. Whoa. Now the word, the word Satan simply means adversary. So Jesus could have been using that adjective. Is that an adjective? Whatever. It's a noun. Thank you. English was not one of my good or favorite subjects. Anyway, so I've heard of adjectives and nouns and verbs and adverbs and pronouns and um, other things. But anyway... Get behind me. So it could be just adversary, but it's usually capitalized, meaning the name Satan. Get behind me, Satan. I mean, ultimately, Jesus knew where that was coming from. Now, Jesus was not calling Peter Satan-possessed or demon-possessed. This was such a a strong statement that Peter was making that he needed a stern rebuke. Now, get behind. Now, remember, this this is out of love. Everything that Jesus did, everything that Jesus said, no matter who he said it to, whether it was to Peter or the Pharisees or other people, he said it because of his love. And sometimes he says things to us to wake us up. Peter, I love you, but get behind me. I got to, that thought, you got to get behind me. That's not what I want in front of me. And, and you're an adversary to me uh, when, we, when you talk like that and when you think like that. And how, how I struggle with going to that cross. Believe me, I struggle with going to that cross. And I do not need people around me trying to keep me from doing what God sent me to do. Get behind me. And look at what he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And we're going to come back to that. We're going to circle back around to that in a little bit. Back to the idea of love. Love, think about this, love without a person to love is useless. Love for the sake of love or being loving, and I just let love be in here, and, and, and I want to be seen as a loving person. I want people to see how kind and compassionate and how loving I am. Well, how's anybody going to know that if it stays in here? Love is not for its own sake. Love is always for the sake of the one, the ones being loved. Always. If it wasn't that way, then the loving would be done selfishly and thus wouldn't be love. Now, think about this. If someone soups up a car, and when I was in high school, we called them gearheads. That might have a different connotation in different people's minds, but somebody who takes a car and maybe puts some glass packs on it or, you know, jacks it, whatever, whatever people want to do to a car, take a little Honda Civic that would normally go make it go, you know, whatever. You know, we soup up a car and we might, we might do it and I say, I really love that car. I really love that car. But let me ask you this. Do you really love the car? Or do you love what the car does for you because you've done that for the car? And then you get to drive around in the car that you souped up because it's your desire and it's your interest and it's your skills and your abilities and nothing wrong with doing that. But then it gets back to the why of why we do what we do. Who are we doing it for? Are we doing it because we love the car or because we love ourselves in the car with the car, right? Well, think about it. We can say that we love. And so much of what we call love is like that. We love what someone does for us. 
We love how someone makes us feel. And as soon as they stop making us feel that way, and as soon as they stop loving us that way, how do we respond? How do we respond? We're hurt. We're angry. We're disappointed. And maybe, maybe our love needs to be refined. Maybe our love, maybe Jesus needs to say to us when it comes to love, you don't have in mind the concerns of God. You have human concerns. Maybe, maybe we need to hear. So because God so loved, what did he do? What's God's what? God gave his only son. Now, you've heard that? Let it sink in. Maybe let it sink in in a whole new way. Love, when it's for the sake of the one being loved, enables true sacrifice. And God sacrificed His greatest treasure for you and me. And your greatest treasure might be your time. Your greatest treasure might be your treasures. Your greatest treasure might be your abilities. Your greatest treasures might be your fears. Your greatest treasure might be your depression. Your greatest tre- The thing that you value the most that gets you what you want in life? Does that need to be sacrificed for the sake of someone else, for the sake of others? He gave His only Son, and love enables true sacrifice. Love enables the one who truly loves to endure pain. Something us guys will never know, childbirth. Love enables, or maybe it's something that a woman just has to endure, I don't know, but it's because of the love, right? The love for that child. And maybe, uh, by the way, thanks, Eve, for um, the greatly multiplying our pain in, in childbirth clause found back in Genesis chapter 3. Anyway, that's enough for that subject. Because God loves us, He does for us what we could never do for ourselves. This required a sacrifice beyond what we can imagine but God did without hesitation. Requires a sacrifice beyond our imagination, but God did without hesitation. God's what's always align with His why's. God's what's always... He doesn't have random what's. He doesn't waste time. Whatever God brings into our lives or allows to come into our lives has a why behind it. And that why is always prefaced with love. Now, there may be some very confusing things that happen in life, but we've got to let the why of God's love go before all of that. Jeff, I love you, and that's why. Jeff, I know this is confusing, but this is why. I love you. And God always has a why behind His what. And when we let His why go before our what's and our questions that we're asking, the why question, why? And if we remember that God loves me somehow, no matter what the what is, it kind of makes it an easier pill to swallow. Because it's never a matter of God doesn't love me. It's never a matter of He doesn't like me. It's never a matter of He wants to punish me. It's never a matter of He's out to get me. It's never a matter of I'm too bad uh, for God. It's never a matter of anything like that. It's always, if we just let the why, God's why, always go before the what's. It'll make the what's a little bit easier, pills to swallow at times. So God has a why and God has a lot of what's. In fact, I think God has a lot of whys, and we're just looking at the loved one this morning. So we we begin to ask the question, what about our why? Our why. Do we have one big why, the same that God does? For God so loved the world. What is it that Jesus said that the greatest commandment is? This is our why, folks. This is our why we do what we do. This is our why of being parents. This is our why of being a spouse. This is our why of being a neighbor. This is our why uh, that that it should infiltrate everything about our family, our friendships, our jobs, our experiences. This is our why. God has assigned us this why. And this why will radically change 
our what's and our how's and maybe even our why we do what we do. Here's our why. Matthew 22, 37 to 38. Love. Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? What did he say? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. A little bit later, Jesus said we're to love one another the way that he loves us. So what does love look like? It looks like Jesus loving us. If you want to know what love looks like, look at Jesus. Read through the pages of the New Testament again and and preface every story, every account that you read, every encounter that Jesus had with anybody, Nicodemus, Peter, anybody else, the Samaritan, uh, woman at the well, lady, we've never given her name, lady at the well, because I love you, I want you to know this. Because I love you, you need to know this. Because I know I, I love you, you need to let me tell you you're hypocritical. Because I love you, you need to let me tell you you're going to perish. Because I love you, you need to let me mess with your whys and your what's in life. So our why is the same why as God's. That shouldn't be all that surprising. And our what's, here's the way I worded our what, our what is to make the main thing the main thing. And what's the main thing? Love. Love is to make and to keep the main thing the main thing. Every day. Every day. I hope you'll get up and pray something like this. God, help me to love you with all my heart, all my soul, all my strength, all my mind. Help me to love my neighbor as myself. Forgive me of being for being selfish. Forgive me of thinking of myself. Forgive me of putting my needs first. Forgive me for not. And, and, and you know, not, not in a condemning kind of way, but just in a house cleaning kind of way. Get that stuff out so you can start afresh, start anew. Because God's not condemning you. If you follow Him, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that's why we say here we aspire to love in such a compelling way so as to inspire others to follow Jesus. Let me ask you this question. Are you open to God challenging your whys and what's? Are you open to that? Really? Because I could go from preaching to meddling real quick, as some people would say. (laughs) But I'm not going to. I'm going to let Jesus give a broad stroke. Okay? I got your attention? I think so. Luke 6.46. Here's a why that Jesus threw out. Why do you call me Lord? Why do you call me Lord and don't do what I say? Why do you call me Lord and read a passage of Scripture about forgiving somebody but then having a better reason for not forgiving them? Why do you call me Lord and read about generosity but refuse to be generous and spend more money on yourself than you do on anything else? Why do you call me Lord and follow me but refuse to be baptized? Why do you call me Lord and fill in the blank? Fill in the blank. Why do... Why? Now we could be like Jesus, like Peter. And Jesus called him out and said, you have your concerns on the things of men not on the things of God. And Peter needed to hear that. And there's been lots of times in my life that I needed to hear that. I remember well the first funeral I ever did in life. Uh, It was on July 30th, 1986. Terry was pregnant, had gone to the doctor for a checkup. She was two weeks overdue with our daughter that was born the next day. And the doctor looked at her and said, let's have that baby today. And we looked at him and said, we can't. (laughs) He said, why not? And I said, because I got a funeral I have to do this afternoon. Now, since we're scheduling a C-section, right, we we had a little bit of, of course, if the baby would have just come, you know, that would have been a different story. But fortunately, the story doesn't go that way. 
This is how the story went. So they scheduled it for the next morning so that I could do the funeral that afternoon. My first <coughs> funeral ever I had ever done in my whole life. And they had me off in a room. You know, the family's there in the, in, in the, in the funeral home, in the, in the room where everybody's going to gather, you know, and just picture a casket. And I'm off over here in a room by myself. And I am sweating bullets. I am like so nervous. I'm like, and this is what I'm thinking. What if I say something stupid? And the, the, the time you don't want to say something stupid is at a funeral. You know, that's what's, all this is going through my mind is like, it's my first funeral ever, and I don't want to mess up. I, you know, and, and I heard, it wasn't audible, but this thought, it sounds like a God thought, ran through my mind. Get your mind off of yourself and start thinking about them. That cured me of my fear of public speaking. Like that. Overnight, over afternoon, I had my, my mind was wrapped up in the thoughts of men, people judging me, people seeing me, people evaluating me, people thinking I said something stupid, and I do, I've done, I've, you know, I've, I've done all kinds, I hear about it at lunchtime when I go home. We always have roast for dinner, roast pastor for dinner, and I'm just kidding, it's not that bad really, it's just, it's just a preacher joke, okay? But I do hear about my mistakes, you know, the, the stupid things. Like I sent out this really powerful email yesterday that some of you got. I misspelled a word. Guess I heard about it. <laughs> and I said, out of that entire email, is that the only thing you got out of that email? Was it my wife? You know, my family knows if you come at me at dinner time, I've got a comeback for you. Just like, is that the only thing you got out of that message? That I mispronounced a word or I put the wrong scripture passage over a verse? You know, like, you know, remember me doing that a year ago? So so I, I do stupid things. But you know what? That's okay. It's okay. If you judge me for that, you, you hear me? That's not my problem. If you don't listen to the truth because of the messenger that's delivering the truth, that's not the messenger's problem. You got your your, your, your mind on the things of men rather than on the things of God. If you only hear the things of men rather than the things of God that might be filtered, might be, I don't know if they are or not, but you know, if they're filtering, I'm just using me for an example because here I am. You know, I could use anybody for an example, but if you're if you're just hearing me and my stumbling and my stuttering and, and like you don't you don't like to and you're not hearing the truth, you're not hearing from God. If you're not hearing the things of God, maybe Jesus needs to rebuke you. Maybe Jesus needs to say, come on, get your mind on the things of God, not on the things of men. Are you hearing me? Are you open to letting Jesus say, why do you call me Lord? Why do you just go through the motions? Why do you just show up uh, sometimes and not on others? Why do you? Why? 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 Why do you let other things be more important? Why? Whatever it may be. It's a very broad... When Jesus said that, he, I don't know that he had anything in particular in mind. And he said it because he loves us. And he says it to me quite frequently, in one way or another. And I constantly, and I hope you will too, adjust yourself. Peter had to adjust himself, adjust his why and his what. Jesus went on to say in that passage of Scripture, and we're going to wrap up with this. Also in Luke 6, For everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. He said that to the people 
whom he just had asked, why do you call me Lord? Why do you call me Lord and don't do what I say? Our why and our what. Our why, Jesus said in John 14, verse 15, if you love me, if you love me, you will keep my commands. If you love me, you will obey me. If you love me, if you have the right why in life, your what's will fall into place. If you have the right why, your what's will follow. If the what's aren't following, guess what? You need to check your why. Right? So, You reach. More than a slogan and more than a four-week event. It's our mission. You, Utica, you, us, you includes me, all of us. Not any one of us, but all of us. And it's more than just for the next four weeks till Easter. It's to Easter and beyond. To quote Buzz. Right? And I'm serious when I say this is the most important season of our church's life. And what happens over the next four or five weeks is going to determine a lot. Not just for us, but for people in Utica. If the houses in Utica were burning down right now, we'd all run and we'd help. Houses are not burning down, but families are falling apart. broken hearts, empty lives. Wondering, is there anybody who cares? Is there a God who cares? And this is way more than just trying to have a hundred people in two services on Easter Sunday. Service is just the top of a funnel where we hope to begin to funnel people into life-changing relationships and experiences. And we need people that are willing to join in and help us create children's ministry, and youth ministries, young adult ministries. Right? Let's pray.